Hello, everybody. Good morning. Oh, thanks for joining. This call is being recorded. Hey, Megan, how are you? I'm good. Maybe meltdown happening right outside my, my office door. Apologies. That's always the right timing. <laughs> hey, good morning. Hey, guys. Chris, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, thanks for joining. Of course. You got Trisha on? Yeah, that's me. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. So we'll give maybe everyone couple minutes is about a hundred almost a hundred folks on the call Hi, right? Jason. all right um, a few things while we're waiting uh, I'm gonna chat the link to the Slido for uh, any questions that folks from the audience want to submit um, just you know I think part of the the format here that that you know that we cool is um, not making this like a webinar where there's like, you know, everyone's sort of hiding behind and listening in, but we're, it's going to be pretty interactive. But of course, you know, with I think 380 people uh, saying yes on the invite, that gets kind of difficult logistically. So um, in the link, you can actually submit questions and upvote questions. And that'll just help us, I think, keep, uh, keep on track um, as we are going through this. So um, but that's kind of the idea for those that haven't been on the call before. Um, you know, I that we're certainly in an unprecedented time, um, and as marketers, you know, I think we're being called on to figure out, you know, how do we navigate these these uh, these times? How do we um, still focus on trying to hit the number? How do we, you know, answer some lead really through something that um, all of us are sort of learning day by day? Um, uh, you know, what changes are being thrown our way? So. With that, I had been texting with a few folks in, in the community and thought this would be a good chance to just have an open dialogue with the community at large and and have kind of a raw, sort of unfiltered kind of conversation. So please, please do uh, send your questions in and we'll make sure to, to get to as many as we can. Um, and this is being recorded as well, so we'll be able to send this out um, eventually as well. So um, with that, why don't we just start um, just as, as folks are getting their questions in with maybe just a high level like state of the union. How are, how are things going um, uh, in general? Um, what's been the business kind of response to COVID kind of from, from all of your kind of respective worlds? So I don't know if uh, Chris, you want, you want to uh, kick us off? Yeah, sure. Um, you guys hear me okay? Yep. All right. Um, it has been, uh, needless to say, a little crazy. Um, in, in the response to it, um, the, the lucky part, you know, at, at Box is we're actually purpose built for remote work. And so uh, for us, we see this as an opportunity really to help our customers and, and help uh, people through all of this. Um, so we've, we've shifted a mindset of selling into helping. And um, I think the team has, has really rallied around that. Um, and we've seen the benefit of it where actually our usage is going up. We've got customers coming to us. Um, so we're, we're seeing it as an opportunity really to help versus an opportunity to go and, and sell right now. Um, but that's a, that's a huge mindset shift for my entire organization. Um, but uh, so far the response has been fairly positive, but we're in a, we're, we're lucky that we're actually um, a solution built for this uh, to some degree. Yeah, maybe um, it makes sense for me to go next because I think um, Drift is in a similar situation. We're different in that we're not public. We're still privately um, held and we still have our VC investors and people like that. So definitely looking at cash flow and like what's our burn and that's super important because we want to make sure that we can prioritize um, retaining as many employees as possible and continuing to do that for as long as possible. So um, interesting for us is that we did not have a work from home culture at all before. So it's definitely been a big adjustment for us. We were in the process of training managers on how to do that, but um, now we've accelerated that, obviously. Um, and we were actually very proactive. Um, I think our CEO was 
um, with the focus on our people, really focus on the health and the safety of our people. So like a week or two before other companies in Boston started sending people home, we did mandatory work from home for both, all of our offices, Tampa, San Francisco, um, Seattle, and Boston. So, um, you know, we really started proactively with the like, this is about the safety of our employees. Then when it started to turn to economic issues, um, we really like buckled down right away. We, um, our CFO stood up right away and within four days had done like a reforecasting of the whole business really looking at like a conservative, what's it gonna take for us to weather the storm and know that with our solution, really helping people in a digital world to capitalize on the pipeline and the revenue they can drive from the website and their digital experiences, um, that we have an opportunity to like really capitalize on this as people think about digital transformation. But to do that, we have to be super smart right now and we have to prioritize. Um, our CEO, Dave Cancel, um, he read a blog a long time ago from Ben Horowitz, which is called um, Peacetime CEO versus Wartime CEO. And so all of our communications within like five days of working from home moved to Wartime CEO and really what does it take to have the transparency and the prioritization from the CEO. So I think from an um, executive leadership standpoint, it's really changed like how much we've like stepped up. The, uh, the communication, um, the leadership, and really like that looking and sort of focus to what are the leaders saying and what should we do? Yeah, we've been talking a lot about the wartime uh, uh, article as well and kind of trying to adjust just our mentality and, and mindset internally. Megan? Yeah, I mean, so uh, I'm with Trip Actions, and as you can imagine, we're on the front lines because we're business travel, and we're a booking tool for travel, and then we support agents. So more than three weeks ago, we saw uh, the issue pretty dramatically. We're also a usage-based uh, model, so if you're not booking and traveling, we have no revenue coming in. Uh, and so we went to wartime pretty fast, and we saw the progression Certainly, um, our customers needed to find out who was traveling in Asia immediately out of the gate. Um, and we had um, some features of Duty of Care. We could show you a traveler map. We knew who was traveling. You could run reports and see who was going to be traveling, and you could quickly communicate. Um, but we, what we didn't have the capability of three and a half weeks ago was to be able to blacklist countries, continents, cities, airports, et cetera. Um, and as that problem started to shift over to Europe uh, and to the UK and then to Canada and to Mexico, so think about it as we progressed over the last three weeks. Um, so uh, our kind of four things that we did was one, we uh, doubled down on customers, understanding what they needed. Uh, then we shifted our um, product uh, engineering team, started to focus on innovating the tools our travel managers needed. So they built out blacklisting capabilities and it was dependent on data. So they built an API to the CDC so we could see level one, two, three in countries, um, three being no travel, certainly two being don't recommend travel, one you know, on the list. Um, and so the engineering team, I got a call from our CEO saying, hey, I need you to launch a new product to all customers Monday. They're building it over the weekend. And so we, they, we quickly started to learn what they were working on, what they were building, what was the impact, how do we take it to market, how do we enable our sales team, let our customers know. Um, and so that was a very you know, um, busy weekend to get that launched. And um, then of course we quickly realized because we're usage-based model and revenue wasn't coming in, the third thing all companies are doing, one, they're focused on customers, two, they're pivoting their products to have product market fit in the new era, three is cash preservation. And yes, our CFO was running multiple models. Um, we were fortunate that we had taken um, a round, a funding round in June, um, but how long can you go depending on how long this goes? Is it three months, six months, a year or two years? Um, and then focusing on your employees and your team because they're shifting from, as you say, being in the office to working from home. There's, you know, it's, it's pretty scary what's going on out there and a lot of unknowns. Um, but the, the other thing we did after we launched Monday is we, we had to basically do, I've been at the company about a year and we had gone from 10 employees in marketing to a little over 50. Um, and all of a sudden our messaging was totally wrong. We were all about the best experience in business travel. <laughs> Nobody was having a good experience in business travel, right? So as you imagine the horror of a CMO and all your um, cadences, all your nurture programs uh, are promoting the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing. They're not, they're tone deaf. Uh, your outreach sequences or your sales loft sequences or whatever sequences you're using are off. Um, all your emails. Uh, so we, 
audited all of our content and we quickly re rewrote the entire website. We rewrote all our nurture programs, which we had 12 different nurture programs based on your persona and country and, and localization. We had to go through rewrite all of them. Uh, we rewrote our um, outreach sequences for our SDRs and our AEs. Then we um, rewrote the pitch deck. It was no longer about traveler experience and controlling costs. It was about traveler safety. It was about business travel continuity. Uh, and then we had to train all our sales teams. So it was a very hectic week of, of changing the product, changing the message, enabling the field, and making sure our message was right. And we weren't perfect at it by any means. Um, so kind of our state of business was immediately shift and then you have to rally a lot of people who are working 15 hour days over the weekends to accomplish this and then we also went as you uh, many of you know we also went through a layoff um, and so that was a difficult time to be um, managing the situation uh, all these people you care deeply about and you you know from my team standpoint you handpick these people to be on your team you're working with them every day and the place that takes the biggest hit um, is marketing uh, your marketing teams your recruiting teams if you if anyone else has gone through a layoff in the last couple of weeks um, those are the heaviest costs and the biggest budget so your marketing budget gets cut significantly your team can get cut um, if we had just ramped up all our recruiting team, we had 45 recruiters, we were going from 1,100 employees to 2,200 employees this year, and we, we uh, went down 296 people um, in a week. And so that was also going on while we were watching uh, the system. So um, I guess if you ask our state, it's been, um, it's been busy. Yeah, I think rapid response is basically what I would call the current state for everybody. And, um, and, and I like the point that you just made about um, the sequences. I think, um, you know, Chris talked about not really being in a selling motion anymore, really being in more of like a, um, you know, engagement motion. We really move right away to sort of the empathy motion of, you know, what what's going on with you? How can we help you? Like I said, we do have a solution that it can help people and especially for our customers. We've moved um, a lot more energy and effort in marketing toward working with the customer support and service organization um, to really reach out to our customers to say, hey, you already have a solution that can help you if you're in an industry that obviously like is still in a place to, to drive revenue. And so how can we help make sure you're getting the most out of the solution that you have um, versus you know just kind of maybe not touching them as much as, as we had in the past. Yeah, totally. I think empathy is the, the key word that, that, that I've heard time and time again on these calls and just in, in uh, many conversations. I, I wanted to ask about um, how, and we'll get to questions after this, but like how your teams are doing from a work from home perspective. I asked the question the first week and it was, you know, there was a lot of like, yeah, you know, I think we'll figure it out and we're going to start investing in some stuff. But for many of us, this has been like almost a month, if not longer. Um, we're human. We're, we're, you know, we're at home. A lot of us are, you know, have, have our children at home too. Like this is getting hard. Um, and I'm wondering if, if there's anything that you all have done from a culture perspective to help invest in the team. How do we sort of like show empathy to our teammates while we're all like isolated, you know, across the globe trying to solve hard challenges with finite resources? Wonder if anyone has any creative creative ideas for how we can kind of help the team along. I definitely have some thoughts on it. You know, my team uh, was cut in half, and so it was. Um, you know, you really one of the things I had to do is I immediately did a stand up meeting with my leads in the morning and a closing meeting at the end of every single day, where I was available to the team, answering questions, talking about immediately what our priorities were for the day, following up on status and what we needed to get done, and checking in with everyone. So that was one thing, stand up meetings, that's not that creative, but it's more that, you know, you're separate and you need everyone to come together and you need them to focus. And some people go into like a, a flight mentality or they freeze. Uh, and so you need to help them through that. Um, and so that was one of the things we did. The other thing we did is every other day we do a team walk um, and that means different things. It's while so social distancing, but if people can either walk around their house, walk around their block, their apartment, um, they can walk to a local park being uh, far from everyone. And we did it over Zoom and we could see each other. And it, it's very refreshing to see the blue sky behind people. People brought their kids, they brought their dog, they walked, you know, we're all over the you know, world, but it was, I would say it was mostly the US uh, and London um, that joined. 
And mm-hmm. just like that spirit of seeing, and we didn't talk about business at all. It was like 15, 20 minutes of us just connecting, checking in on each other. We've had people who have family that have died, family that have committed suicide. Like it's been a rough three weeks. Um, many people are getting laid off and a lot of things are happening. And then obviously COVID's affecting people. Um, the other thing we did, I'm going to turn my camera off and just show you. We kicked off a thing called Pass the Plane. Um, it's, it's something that we did within the company and then we, we open it up outside of it. And it's this idea that we're, we're separate and we can't be with each other, but we throw the plane to each other and we video ourselves. We're not, some people were confused and thought we all got together in the same room. We didn't like we spliced videos together. We add music to it. We had people tag their city and their state and their country, and we've been passing it around to each other. And it's very up there's something sad about it, but it's also something very uplifting. And, um, we challenged our children. And when you see your colleagues at home with their kids, building it and throwing it and, and just um, that kind of bond that you have. Um, it, it, I think it's made a difference for us as a company. And um, when you have someone in your family, like my dad's isolated right now. Um, and I've been, uh, I went grocery shopping for him, but he's, he's at home and he's miss, He's a social guy, but he's in his seventies. And of course he's really scared, um, but he loves planes. He loves doing things. I called him Sunday, challenged him. He like quickly started making it like in his pajamas, holes in his shoes and like, posted this video of him making it and then he like tried to tilt the camera to throw the plane and then he tagged my nephew in Albuquerque and my nephew started doing it and sent a video and it was it's like when you get people in your family or other outside also to start doing it you realize first of all it's kind of fun and it, it sort of ties you together and everyone some people didn't have paper I was like how do you not have paper so they were like doing bills and they were doing cards and you know people started to get creative with it um, so I don't, I definitely think you can do things that bring your community together um, and that can, um, you know, lift your spirits, but be respectful um, because we certainly, we lost employees um, and we're, you know, we're going through a rough time, but you still can't forget that you're human and coming together. And so I don't know, something like that, that ties, ties you together. That's awesome. I'm going to catch the plane here in uh, Scottsdale and send it uh, after this call. Please do. <laughs> Yeah, just to, to echo that, Jonathan from Trainual here, I think Megan hit the nail on the head that like more than ever, you know, it's been a hot topic, this work-life balance thing for like the past five years, right? And more than ever right now, life is forcefully infused into work or the other way around. Like I can see into everybody's living room right now, right? And there's something incredibly human and, and authentic and amazing about that. And the more that we embrace that work-life blend and do these kinds of things and make these connections and conversations about more than just the work at hand, which of course there's a lot and there's fires to put out everywhere, but like, you know, scheduling remote lunches, um, we, we do, we use that like donut extension inside of Slack to do like impromptu meetings with people. Um, we started like a monthly virtual book club, but the, the more that you can connect with your team and talk about things that they care about in their home environment and around them, that's supporting them right now personally, the, the more productive they will be professionally and want to put in the extra hours to put out the extra fires, right? That's awesome. I agree ideas. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we've looked at is like, what does it mean to like really have the employees be sort of healthy at this time, right? And so that is the sort of forced um, whole self at work and the um, empathy, not just with customers and through the sales cycle language and everything else, but just with our employees, right? Like some people, we have a pretty young workforce. So a lot of people don't have kids at home, but then we do have a lot of people who do have kids at home. And so we're like really understanding like what is the environment of everyone? Like I have a husband who works in an industry that basically just can't work right now. So I have a husband at home who is like basically not working. Um, And so, you know, that has an impact on everyone and, and recognizing what's going on. But so as a company, we decided that we would maintain the rituals that we always had in the office. So we have like a Monday morning, everyone gets together, like business metrics meeting. And then we have a Friday afternoon, everyone gets together, show and tell. And we've like consistently held those and made sure to kind of like keep those consistent rituals. We also have this organization in Boston that would come in and do like a weightlifting workout on Tuesdays, every other Tuesday. And they've moved that to be 100% virtual. So it's like two o'clock our time in California, but it's like five o'clock East Coast time. And so now like everyone has like their cans of soup and they're doing like weightlifting and everything. Um, And so we've tried to move to like fun, like different um, rituals. We also have a newsletter that we would send out every week called Inside Drift. And we've done the new like work from home 
inside drift where we have pictures of like people with their dogs and their kids and other things to kind of like make it as human as possible. Um, and on top of that, we have a Slack channel and we added like a 24 seven inside drift zoom. So like at any time of the day, you can just like jump into the zoom and see who else is there and like just have personal conversations and, you know, go for a walk or whatever you want to do. Um, so like we've tried to do different things. And then the final thing we did was like try and make it not just about us. So we've done two different things about fundraising. Um, we have, um, a learning a portal which is called insider and it has like a paid version so we discounted that and if people join it we're actually giving money to um, feed America and so we like really pushed that and we had a big like social um, engagement amongst employees to like make their own drift videos and post it to LinkedIn and like really get that going as a way to kind of focus on something that's like not us but like what's actually happening outside of us um, and then uh, today we have um, Dan Kurtz who's doing something called the cocktails and conversations and so he's like going to do a cocktail making workshop like teaching people how to actually make various cocktails and if you want to participate you have to pay and that's about like feeding restaurant workers and like putting that money back out into like the hourly workforce i love the idea of activating and supporting a local the local economy that's awesome yeah, yeah. yeah. chris it, oh, yeah. i love it like um I, in addition to a lot of what what you guys have described i think there's if you think about the practical uh point of our and how do you how do you make sure your team stay healthy and and um, around this, one of the things we've done is, uh, in addition to the daily stand-up from a leadership perspective, we start every meeting five minutes late um, intentionally because I think one of the things that we're all challenged with is we're on video back to back to back and it's like, I just need five minutes to get out, away from my desk. I want to go get a drink. I want to go outside for, so I would, I would encourage everyone like five minutes past the hour, every meeting like start five minutes late. Um, the other thing that we've really ramped up, which is critically important right now, is just communication. So we're doing constant, you know, ask me any things with the team. Uh, we use Slido, so it's anonymous. They can ask any questions that they want. Uh, we do this as a company every Friday. We have this notion of Friday lunch where we used to do it um, in our cafeteria in Redwood City. Uh, we've now done that globally. So we have sort of state of the union, what's going on across our entire leadership team, but we also have an AMA every Friday. So, and the questions are fantastic. Everyone hears it. We have like probably 70, 80% of the company that actually logs in and, and listens to this. Um, and we're just making sure that everyone is fully informed around what's happening with the business, where our priorities are, changes to, um, that we're making as a leadership team. So there's like some practical things that I, that I would encourage if you're leaders, over communicate, um, the team needs it. And anytime you think you've sent and the team should know, the reality is send it one or two more times because I think it's just there, you know, the communication um, is critically important. And then some of the other fun things that we're doing, uh, yesterday at lunch, we did a trivia uh, contest uh, across one of my teams uh, where someone created the questions and we went back and forth and um, the prize was uh, a gift certificate to one of the local restaurants for takeout. So the team that, you know, each got, you know, $25 uh, to order from a local restaurant. Um, so again, supporting the community around that. And then we're also doing a lot with our, our box.org organization and helping people find a way to give back and help, not just financially, but can you digitally volunteer? Um, what can you do uh, to provide your expertise and guidance to other folks that are, that are thinking about this at this time? So um, those are just some of the things that we're working through. And we're continuing to calibrate, right? Each week we, you know, we learn and, and we figure it out and, and people come up with creative ideas that we're embracing, so. I think it also goes a really long way, even when you're talking with your team or people that you might normally, to just don't underestimate the, how are you doing, right? That simple, how, is, how are you doing? How are things going? Well, how can I help you and what do you need from me? I think even when it's people that's not on your team, people that you work with, whether it's a developer or office admin, anybody that you might come in contact with, that's gone a long way because then it starts conversations. It allows you to get to know that person even deeper than you might have before. And sometimes you can be amazed at what people might say, I'm not doing well, right? And that's happened a few times where people are like, my friend just got this, or you know, my sister just got laid off. How do I deal with that? So it, it's, it allows for a lot of conversation as well. So I think don't underestimate the just simple, how are you doing? Okay. Yeah, I think that's super important. And, um, and I, I've been starting every meeting like that. And I, um, I think people are also being really transparent because this environment where you're like already in your living room, et cetera, and really learning. And I think 
even beyond what's happening in your company and the craziness and like the changes happening week to week, like that's already a lot to absorb. But I think the key thing is like what's happening around you. Like I mentioned about my husband, but I've talked to other people who, you know, like their um, sister ended up going into early labor. And it's like, can you imagine like having to go to a hospital, like kind of early labor to have a baby? Like it's just this like stress that like in a day-to-day environment would be a little bit stressful, but on top of everything else, it just really is like impactful. And, and understanding that, especially with your team or like you're saying with like developers or whoever you're working with, I think it really helps you calibrate like, okay, maybe the request I had is not that important, you know, or maybe I need to say like, okay, like, can you get this to me? before tomorrow at midnight or whatever, like just to give people the flexibility. And even with the people that have kids that are working from home juggling, like we've had a lot of just like, okay, give us the realistic timeline when you can do this. And like, let's go through your priorities to make sure that you're like really pushing things off your plate. I think that's a critically important round. Like people are going to work at different times and hours. I've given my team permission that they can block any time on their calendar. If they've got, we'll work asynchronously um now because people have kids at home that they're, they're just working different hours so that's the other thing is just be critically just be flexible um because everyone's dealing with a certain uh different situation so one quick thought um on the checking on how you're how are you doing um maria pergolino's on the call um she had an idea on our last call that i thought was great was just having folks respond with their favorite emoji um and just doing like this emoji check-in every now and then and i tried it um, and it was really interesting because some folks had like interesting choices for the emoji they chose. And I followed up with them and had a, had a conversation with them and actually led to some pretty good um, kind of you know, moments of vulnerability. Um, and then Chris, to your point on supporting local businesses, just a, a thing that I, we, we ran across, um, Square released a tool that allows you to um, basically look up um, by zip code and find like all of the local small businesses that are, I guess, square customers, I'm not hundred percent sure that are sit and, and they're transacting gift cards, um, through the square platform. And so if you have your team, you know, spread out across the world, um, you want to know what the, the local small businesses in Wichita are like right around, like where your, your teammates live, that might be a great way to, to help kind of surprise them and also um, serve them in this time. So let's, let's go to Slido. A few of the folks were asking about the tool Chris was mentioning. It is called Slido, um, and here it is. Um, and so okay, you, can, you can go to slido.com, enter that code, put in the questions. I've, I put the link into the, our, our chat a few times as well. But let's take this first question. Um, we're, we're getting into the tactics here, which I think is, is, is uh, super interesting. Um, budgets are definitely lower. Um, certainly, you know, to Megan's point, marketing is, is often one of the hardest hit in this area. Um, and the need to focus on organic and earned is, um, is, is important versus paid. Where, where would you start? I can take a stab at this and then, um, can pass it, uh, pass it to the folks, um, on the call. But for us, you know, what we're doing, uh, you know, first of all, I think marketing in general at front, it, we're sort of like, um, this was the year where we're really investing in, in kind of building out the function. So we're ramping a lot of our paid efforts. Um, we're ramping, you know, starting to do more trade shows and that sort of thing. Um, been at the company for six, six months at this point. Um, and so for us, we're sort of been ramping up, but we hadn't reached kind of the, the amount of spend on the paid side where um, the cut hurt super hard. Um, and yet we still had to go back and say, okay, trade show budget, like that's the first one to go. Um, you know, let's look at the hires that we wanted to make this quarter. We're going to freeze them um, and, you know, push it out until we get a little bit more certainty into, you know, what, what's happening in the world. Um, we're like, you know, Chris and Trisha and that, you know, we're built to help enable remote work as well. So, you know, we're, we're, we're hopeful that, that, you know, we can come across, come, and we, we can sort of like ride this out and then want to make sure we can sort of accelerate from a growth perspective once we're on the other end of it. Um, and so we, uh, on the paid side, what we've basically done is taken a responsible look at where we were spending and just making the decisions that I think we would have had to make anyway at some point um, and just sort of, you know, took a more conservative approach on it. Um, but because we are a little earlier stage, or if there are folks on the call that, that are, are sort of earlier in their, their kind of, um, kind of business journey, um, we are in the mode of building a community, building a brand, developing the content machine, 
And thankfully, a lot of that is based on organic. And so, you know, it, it's a great time to, I think, double down on content creation and, and serving your, your, your customers, certainly, and also folks that are um, within your sphere of influence within your audience. Um, and I think the important bit is, um, to Megan's point, like ensuring that the content you're creating isn't uh, sort of rote content that we would have otherwise you know, published in a world uh, without COVID. Like we need to lead with empathy and really think about um, how can we serve um, our customers and our community and uh, our overall audience with content that's relevant today. Um, so that's kind of where we are in our journey. I'm, I'm curious, uh, folks and the other panelists, um, how are you guys uh, approaching the paid versus organic kind of investment? Yeah, one of the big things that um, Drift has always done is um, really driven the business through a content inbound strategy. And so um, actually one of the first things that we had to do was look at with work from home, with kids at home, et cetera, what content actually continued to make sense because like we couldn't do four blog posts a day while people were juggling everything else. And honestly, we probably didn't need to be doing four blog posts a, month, a day anyway. So it was like, okay, why are we doing these? What are we doing? And then pivoting what some of the message was about. Like we actually have so much learning from both sales and marketing in, um, individuals and our tool is helping those people so that we could actually become a resource of like, how can I get the most out of my digital? How do I increase conversion? How do I target the right companies? How do I use Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever it might be, not about our product, but just about help. And so we really ramped up an entirely new conversation thread on our blog and in the content that we're pushing out. And we actually um, started creating ads to put ads out into the market to help get people to see like, hey, here's helpful content so that it wasn't just about like Drift and our tool, but really more Drift as the company that can help you through this crisis if you're in sales and marketing. Um, and that's been a really big thing for us. We also saw, in, and we were like ramping up a lot of sort of third uh, party um, event participation this year. Um, and obviously those things started to get to cancel like super early. And so immediately when we saw that the events were canceling, we had this idea that we still needed to probably get in front of people and help people learn. So we sent an email out to 20 different um, sales and marketing SaaS companies and said, hey guys, do you want to do an event with us in the middle of April? And um, every single company almost, I think like 90% at least responded, yes, we want to be a part of this like virtual event. And so we put together this thing we're calling the Rev Growth Summit. And instead of just saying like, hey, how do you take your event money and like do something like everyone else is doing, like we're trying to take a totally different approach. We've sent all the speakers, like microphones, green screens, lighting equipment, whatever, to like make the event like really a special event versus just another Zoom, because we're all kind of like participating in Zoom every day. Um, and so we're really trying to think differently about that. We of course had to cancel um, all of our CXO dinner series that we were doing. And so now we're moving that into a uh, like, um, exclusive 20 person get together in conversation. Um, and we're trying to make it into an experience. There's all of these companies that have published really great like virtual tours. So um, the first event that we had to cancel was in New York City in the new restaurant that's in the base of the MoMA. And the MoMA actually has like a really cool virtual tour. So we're getting all those people together with like the virtual tour of the MoMA. So it becomes like a shared experience for those 20 people still versus just sort of like a one-to-many event. Cool. I can, I can, or Megan, go ahead. Oh, all right. Um, well, from a budget standpoint, I mean, a lot of our budget was events. We had a big user, uh, user conference we were kicking off, one in the U.S., one in Europe. We had tons of trade shows and partner stuff, and um, we had just ramped the um, team from one person and events to uh, eight or nine. Um, so the first thing we cut was events, um, and that was a pretty big uh, item. And then anything we... Um, we're committed to we went back and either we negotiated out of um, We one of the things we were doing a lot of my talk is about what we did to cut back on costs, but um, We we were running airport uh, ads on the 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 tar um, the jet bridges 
uh, which were really awesome when people were at airports, but all of a sudden people weren't at airports. And, you know, we looked at the contract and we have it for a year and we we're pretty locked and solid and there's really no like escape route. Um, but you know what we found is that um, these vendors are humans and they understand and we, we reached out to them. And what they did is um, they they didn't refund our money, which is okay, but they extended our contract out and they they're not... Um, billing us for the next three months. So all the ads will stay up. They're not going to pull it down because they can't resell that anyway. Nobody's going to put ads up on jet bridges right now, but they, uh, they push the contract three months down the road. So we'll still get the value of it. Um, and so my recommendation is anything you have, anything's pretty negotiable. I think if you reach out, even, um, vendors that we had, you know, the hotels are pretty reasonable. They're willing to either refund if it was far enough out that we had um, like evening things at, or they're willing to give you credit and let you have 18 months to spend it. So you can um, push that spend down. So we, we spent a ton of time the last couple of weeks renegotiating or exiting contracts, um, which is good. Um, anything because we took such a big hit we went and reached out to like content syndication vendors and others or ones that we had um you know we were going to send a newsletter to their community and we, and we said if you can't let us out can you give us more so instead of one email to your community can you give us three instead of one ad can you give us two you know ways where we got much more out of our money since we have less of it and you know they know that um we're going to re you know we're going to rebound actually history shows travel usually takes the first hit in these things like 9 11 um sars other things it drops dramatically but then it re rebounds even stronger and so they know that at some point we're all going to want to get out of our houses we're all going to want to travel businesses need to go on people don't buy hundred thousand dollar software um at home or over videos like we're going to have to be meeting and selling and executives are going to be flying and so they were all very reasonable and, and figuring out that out, could they let us out? Could they give us more? So that's one of the things we did. The other thing is we did double down on content while all of this was going on, all the rewriting, we realized that we needed a community because most of our customers, travel managers and travelers had all these questions. Um, you know, what are, what's, um, obviously things like where can you get tests at for uh, coronavirus um, where what is shelter in place what are the travel rules what countries are shut down what are the um, level one two and three and we we had a ton of questions so um, we decided to evaluate uh, something it had to be inexpensive but we wanted to stand up a community and so we stood up uh, community.tripactions.com in about two and a half days something you should probably take a month or two to figure out because we had to assess technology get through procurement stand it up then we had to um, make it look halfway decent then we had to get content and contributors and influencers and um, so we launched that really quickly uh, and I was really impressed how many people started to come in and um, contribute content and you know it sits on your domain so it's community.tripactions.com so as people are coming in searching on things they need right now and it is relevant to our community because they're business travelers and they need to understand what's going on so if you can find what's relevant to your community if you don't already have a community site we used vanilla forums it was just really easy to stand up really quickly for us um, and if you can um, get your community going and, and and that side of it we saw and we're still seeing a ton of traffic into that site. Um, so that was one thing we did. Um, and then we, we did office hours like we're doing right now, but we did it for CFOs and for head of people, um, chief people officers, because certainly CFOs right now are all trying to figure out, they're all being asked to do the replan because the environment's changed. They're all being asked to do cash preservation. They're trying to figure out, is this a two month thing, a four month thing, six months? Are you guys laying off? Are you like, what's your contingency plans? What software is critical? Like they're assessing all of our technology stacks right now. They're um, trying to get out of contracts. And so um, we brought um, CFOs at, together and we've done, it's the third week we've done it. Uh, and we have about 300, I think it's today, on today or tomorrow of CFOs and about 200 of heads of people. And it's not about us pitching to them, it's them having a conversation and we invite our customers, our CFOs of our customers to lead the, the uh, community. And we don't follow up on sales. Um, from a sales standpoint and you know just like we need to come together and figure out what the heck we're supposed to do from a marketing standpoint right now your cfos or the personas you're targeting also need to come together and figure that out uh, and it's been a great forum and um, i think it's your opportunity because you're not selling right now is to bond with your customers and your prospects and to 
have some sort of tie to your brand and to provide them value and like we're saying provide them empathy and a forum to uh, figure out their jobs um, so um, those are kind of the things that we did around cutting our budget and then trying to figure out how we um, connect with our uh, customers super pragmatic thanks thanks megan yeah i think there's been a lot of questions too because events were hit so hard and um if you're in a company that does software for events or other things like those companies have been hit really hard um one question that i've been getting around events is like what are you doing with your events team and everything that megan just um spoke about in terms of like renegotiating contracts moving dates moving things like that's like the full-time job of my events person and it has been for the past month um on top of us doing this like big virtual event so um I only have one person in events. Um, we obviously had an agency that was helping us. And so we're repurposing a little bit of like the contracts we had with them to help us in terms of like the negotiations and things like that. And obviously they'll end up being hit because like that's all they do. And we're not going to be executing these events, but we have been working with them to basically, you know, try to help them out a little bit to repurpose some of the work that we have in just renegotiating everything and figuring out like what is on the table, what can we get out of, et cetera. Um, we have, we're kind of known for our big hyper growth events or like thousand person plus events. And we had one that was scheduled for May in London and one that we were planning for October. Um, and we've canceled both of those. And so we're definitely like pulling back on our event spend, but really looking like Megan was saying of like, how can we put groups of people together? And that's where it like comes back to those like private, like 20 person events. We're doing those both for our customers and for prospects. Um, and I just wanted to shout out because Megan um, mentioned this product, Vanilla. We actually built out the insider um, Drift Insider community in, in, in Vanilla. And we had identified that because our brand is about helping people like be the best in sales and marketing. And so that was already on our agenda and we had already launched that like the month before this happened. And so it's actually been a really good vehicle for us to just have people um, have conversations. And it's also great for us because we can see like, what is the conversation that people are having about the current crisis? And then therefore, how can we do more blog content and other content to kind of help? Because we just have that ongoing feed of people having that conversation. Yeah, and you know, I to the you know you have one event. I I now have one events person uh, left on the team, uh, but for the first week and a half when we were pivoting, I was trying to shift all of them their roles to be programs people. Like I thought, you know, and they saw they saw our budget being slashed. They knew we weren't doing events, and I was like, now it's time to redefine what you do. If you can write, you're writing. Uh, you're doing social, you're writing programs, you're working with the SDRs to rewrite all their cadences. And like, I tried to quickly pivot the team. Um, and unfortunately we couldn't keep the size of the team that we had, but certainly if anyone else is kind of, you know, I feel like we were a couple weeks ahead because we were in business travel. Like now's the time to get your teams to pivot their skills. And, and if, if you're uh, in field marketing or events and you see a decline, like now's your chance to like quickly step up and support sales, figure out what they need, figure out social media, come up with creative ideas, start writing content, like shift what you're focused on. Cause I don't know when field marketing events is going to come back in the next six months. Uh, I think there'll be a lot of virtual. So learning all the virtual technology, if you're in that field, I think it matters a ton. Um, and just trying to figure out like, what can you, how can you pivot your skills? Yeah, I think that's an important point is um, in wartime, the roles and responsibilities start to blend as you're just trying to get new things out the door. And we, we actually have a fairly large uh, field marketing organization globally, um, and we had done a ton of events. So it is a full-time gig just trying to replan and figure out, do I get a refund? Do I re reschedule this? So there's a lot going on from that perspective. But also at the same time, I'm trying to leverage those uh, individuals to think creatively around how do we engage and do events and to Tricia is like smaller little things. Like for instance, one of the creative um, things my team is working through is doing a cooking class with a sh an iron chef and a small set of customers where they're in their home and they're learning how to cook as everyone, this big revival um, where my team came up with that. I was like, that's fantastic. Like they can come in and they can zoom and they can all, you know, create something. So I think that's, you know, my team is super creative around thinking through that. But so that's what we're doing from an events and like trying to figure out the other big one is just customers right now are willing to engage and help other customers. And so what we're finding is some of our, our best customers were saying, Hey, can we do a session and get you on a zoom and just talk to other customers around what you're doing, how you're dealing with it, similar to what we're doing here, 
everyone is like, sure, um, I'll jump on. And so the field marketing team has now moved more towards <clears throat> doing those events versus physical events. So that's one thing. Um, I think going back to the, what are we doing around organic and working through that, we simplified our messaging. Um, again, it's like down to uh, the way I keep describing it is sort of this Maslow hierarchy of needs. It's like, I've got to keep my family safe. I've got to make sure I've got, you know, food, toilet paper, you know, what everyone is like literally worrying about. And then for us, it's like, they just need to access their content and be able to do their job. And that's what people care about. And that's what they want to hear from us. So we've, we've looked at all of our documentation, all of our, our collateral and saying, Hey, how do we work through that? Um, the other thing that we focus a lot around is SEO. Um, and then just more and more content marketing. And we made a really tough decision uh, as we as we thought about this. We ungated a lot of our stuff, um, which made my team really uncomfortable because that's, you know, as we drive pipeline. But at this time, we said, hey, it's more important to get our customers what they need. And we will ungate a lot of that, whether that's training or webinars or other things, which was really, really painful. Um, but we, we made that decision as a leadership team. Um, the other thing that we're working through um, is uh, is outreaches from our CEO. Um, so we've actually had Aaron, we've got a very dynamic CEO. We've personalized outreaches to the top 250 customers and then we're going down to the next 500. And it's really about that empathy and tone and we, whatever you need, we're, we're willing to help. Um, so that's really, really resonating because people are saying, thank you, um, we really appreciate. I actually could use X and so we've given um, the ability for customers to do overages. Um, we're giving free trials. And so we're literally at this time just trying to figure out how can we be a helpful partner uh, versus trying to monetize this at this point. And I think long term, um, the brands that really focus on the customer experience and, and helping them, I think will that'll have a lasting effect, um, you know, over the next, uh, you know, years or, or so. Yeah, I think on that as well, like um, my demand gen team is super stressed because one of the things we initially saw was that we actually had pretty high um, interest in leads and things coming in, but like the conversion to meetings and then held meetings and demos and moving to pipeline has like really slowed down, um, especially in the first three weeks of like moving to work from home where people are just like, I don't know if I'm going to have a job. I don't know like how to juggle my family and being at home and like just so much like up upheaval. Um, we're actually starting to see that um, trend back toward normal. Like I don't think it'll get to like full normal um, in the time that we're all still at home, but um, it definitely picked up a little bit. But like what I've been focusing on with the team is when you look at the priority of what you're doing, like, of course, we want to be aligned with sales. We want to have empathy for our own salespeople for the fact that like they actually only get paid when they make their quotas. And so like, let's work toward helping them. Let's not ignore that. But at the same time, let's look at what we as marketers can really control. We can control, like you're saying, having the empathy. We can control being helpful. We can control helping people see what Drift can do to help them be successful. And then if we actually use this time to build the brand, identify what it is that we can do for people, identify how we behave, identify sort of like that like wide top of funnel to get like the right companies in. When the economy picks back up, we'll actually have like a broader group of people to go back and to reach on. So like we're, re, you know, we're replanning our goals for Q2 right now. And, um, and by the um, beginning of next week, we're going to have sort of the stretch goal, which is like, what is our new pipeline goal based on the goals that was like, we're all kind of wondering like what's going to happen with like our ACV. But then like the real goal I want for my team is, hey, let's look at our, look, our list of target accounts. Like how can we get to 100% impression on those people? How can we get to 100%, like that's not gonna happen, but like what percent of engagement can we get from them that they are interacting with free content and the ungated things and everything else so that later like we're just able to capitalize on um, the effort that we're doing and we're not just like sitting around saying, hey, it's impossible to do anything. That's great. Um, let's move back to Slido. I think we've got time for a few more questions here. Um, so this one, Jason, thanks for submitting this. Um, we've talked a little bit about virtual gatherings and, uh, Trisha, I know you spoke about the, um, the, the partner kind of, uh, ecosystem one coming up here in April, which is, uh, interesting. How, how are you innovating on your own virtual gatherings to separate organizations from everyone else? And actually I think you or Megan, somebody had the idea around, uh, almost like field dinners, yeah. but virtual 
with in-home experiences, which I thought was really clever. The only thing I'll add before I'll, I pass, I'll pass the mic is I've been really inspired by this format, actually, because um, this is very human and raw and anyone can unmute if you really want to <laughs> and say something, right? And that's fine. That's cool. I think that makes it very real. Um, and so this in particular is not a front kind of sponsored thing. Like I'm running it off of a Google, as you saw, a Google form. Um, but I imagine like what are ways to kind of innovate on the traditional webinar kind of format and make it more human. Um, I'm learning a lot from, from this group. And so I'm wondering if that, that might be something that we bring into the actual marketing mix as well. Yeah, we, Andy, we've talked a lot about, um, it, we're, we're giving ourselves permission to be less formal and less curated. And I actually think people are craving this versus I think we'll get to a point where everyone's going to be doing webinars. Everyone's going to be doing digital events, but people are going to be craving the interaction and the authenticity and the realness of what we're dealing with versus like something that's so curated. So I think that is something we're going to have to balance as marketers moving forward. Totally. Yeah, and I think that's the, um, the idea of sort of the idea in general of doing CXO dinners is like get a new way to kind of not pitch your product, but to get a bunch of people together around a topic. And so we're trying to look at how do we do that and how do we have the experience similar to what you're talking about? Like, let's get a chef to like teach people something. So if we can get an exclusive group of 20 people, we let people know, Hey, this is exclusive. You're really going to have like a true one-to-one -one conversation with the people at the event. Then we can do like, have somebody teach a um, cooking class, teach about like making mixed drinks, go on a virtual tour together, whatever. It actually like bonds those people together because I think that's a lot of what people are missing is that connection. It's also like this authenticity is great too, but it's like, how do you continue to build those connections, introduce great people together, bring people together so that in the future they have those connections to leverage as well. Yeah, so I have two things. One, first, Ethan, I want to know how you put your name like your newscaster and your title underneath it in front of you. You have to share your <laughs> tips. Um, yeah, I actually just use, there's a couple of different apps. There's Minicam or there's a Snapcam that you can just add all kinds of nice little features. So like I just did like a lower thirds uh, on it, which is fun for meetings because it's just like a dumb little way to like, oh, hey, I'm Ethan. So that's, right. that's the snap cam or mini cam or either one. All right. They're the about job. to get a boost because that's cool. Um, <laughs> my, my thoughts on, I mean, we're definitely looking at trying to do a virtual conference and see what we can um, tap into. We're also nervous like, on some of the companies that we were doing physical booths at are switching to virtual, but we just don't think you get the brand and the tie and the relationship building. So we're worried about the value of if we sponsor something and it's virtual, um, is it the same value you would have if you're in person? Of course, we think not. But um, one thing that I know is true in times of recession and depression, people, community colleges do really well. People go back to school, they reinvent themselves and they learn. So what I would actually do and what we're working on is I would stand up an LMS and a training course and a certification and I would build coursework to make your customers stronger, smarter, better. Um, can you certify, like for us, can we certify them on um, policy management for travel, best practices around traveler safety, um, different things like that. Um, you know, EAs that they're support their executives, there's a bunch of different learnings that we pass on to them. Can we, can they come out and be certified with our product and be an expert in it? Um, so I, I think a good thing to do since a lot of people are at home and are going to be reinventing or learning more or have the time not maybe not have the time, but they have the desire to to get better or distract their minds. I would create educational coursework for them. I love that we did that at Gainsight with um, we call it Customer Success University. It was effectively just a string of content, a series of content that we kind of locked behind an LMS and get, have folks get certified in customer success. And it was um, uh, it was a great program for us. Still is today. Um, all right, we have. Seven minutes left, so I think it's time for one more uh, meaty question. Um, so let's pull this up. Thank you everyone for your engagement um, today. So three, top three priorities, I think that's a good one to, to kind of end on. Um, and I can, I can take a stab at this first. The first for us is um, uh, we're, we're reforecasting Q2. And so we're looking at, uh, the leading indicators to, to the number based on what we're seeing. We're not a sort of like, you know, 
six month sales cycle, 100K CV type product. And so for us, we can look at things like traffic. We can look at things like, you know, trial conversion and different things and see what has changed over the last few weeks and try to model that, at least in terms of a, a best guess into what's going to be happening in Q2. So that's something we're working on right now. And the next question on here is the conversation with your CFO. We're having a lot of those uh, right now um, because obviously when the forecast goes down, the budget has to come down. And so um, that's where, where we're prepared on the marketing side to take that haircut I mentioned earlier. Um, second is honestly, I think a lot of the ideas we talked about here are stuff that we're thinking heavily about, like our messaging in general. We've been in the last six months working on this brand, re, kind of like rebrand, repositioning exercise for the product, trying to simplify our messaging to, I think that was Chris's point. Um, and that's something that we're working on activating in Q2. And so we're kind of in the, the final stages of that um, uh, process. Um, and then three, it's uh, in general, it's this idea of investing in the team, um, actually investing in the team, but I'll, I'll, I'll cheat and add a fourth um, that I just remembered, um, post sales. So marketing is working um, very closely with our customer success team to make sure that we're um, doing a lot of the one to many type of work at scale to protect sort of the long tail of the base. And also in ensuring that we can go deep with our existing customer, with our kind of larger customers um, and build that and keep investing in that relationship when we're all kind of uh, virtually spread apart. So those are, the, I think, the, the four things that, that we're, we're thinking about a lot at front. I can, I can jump in. So, um, you know, obviously similar, uh, making sure the team is, you know, safe and, and um, in that situation and, the, and our customers as well. But I think uh, we're a public company. So one of the differences, we actually um, have the investor community and we've got, you know, we've got earnings call and we're in the last month of our Q1, uh, which is always interesting when you just finalize your budget and then we've completely revamped that. Um, we're a fairly data-driven organization. So um, the conversations with the CFO um, are painful for all, right? As you have to go recast and, and there's a bunch of scenario planning that we're working through, but we also have fairly strong ROI across this program span. So when we say, hey, you take, uh, you know, take the gas off of SEM, it's actually going to hurt here. And then, so we just have to be careful. So I would encourage you to figure out for all of your um, program span, ROI is critically important because you have to have that conversation with the CFO because if you just cut, it's actually going to hurt your growth. Um, so that's one thing of uh, just making sure that we get to the number and then what, how do we maintain pipeline um, at least to some, some level of coverage that allows us the continued growth rate of what we're trying to expect. Um, I think, uh, Anthony, to your point, uh, we're pivoting very strongly on customer marketing. Um, and we're, we're, you know, a lot of that, what you described, creating courses for end users, um, making sure they understand how to use our product in very simple ways. Um, sending out end user outreaches, um, that sort of thing. So it's like not about selling, it's just getting them adoption across the entire base is like critically important. And then uh, third, I think as we're all dealing with this, we're pivoting from sort of the the last three to four weeks of like triage mode into, okay, now, now what are we going to do this summer? What are we going to do in the fall? Um, how do we start to look at that mix? What does the budget look like? And how are we going to maintain this uh, moving forward? Because I think right now everyone has been so heads down. Um, we actually haven't taken our, you know, our, picked our head up and said, what are we going to do in the fall? Um, and we have to start thinking about that right now because it's going to be very different than our original plan going into the year. So those are probably my top three. That's great. Uh, my, my top three are um, sales CSM partner enablement. So making sure they have everything they need, CSM to take care of our customers' sales, to close deals, um, and the partner team to, to keep those relationships. Uh, number two is sales pipeline, so net new stuff coming in, so they have stuff to work on. Uh, once they close, what's already in there? And then content, just a lot of focus on what we're doing around content for the community, for web, for blog, for social, et cetera. Things we can do that don't cost money. <laughs> I love that. I think, um, you know, I keep telling my team that I was um, at Salesforce during the 2008 downturn and the people that I worked with at that time are like, some of my closest friends and I call them like the Salesforce mafia. Like most of those people I worked with are now CMOs of some other company like in the Bay Area or whatever else. And it's like my total go to network for um, people that I ask for questions and what are you doing and like regular check ins. And I think this 
type of time, although it's really difficult and obviously none of us would choose to go through it. It's a really bonding time of like, okay, how can we be scrappy? How can we like keep things going? How can we be innovative and thinking of like new ideas and new ways to get things done? And I think that that is like, that's a like, you know, silver lining in sort of like what it is that we're having to go through. Um, in terms of my priorities, I think the number one thing is like the employees connecting to the employees, ensuring everybody um, is connected and um, really feeling like they understand like what is it that they're being asked to do and how do we prioritize properly. Um, and then um, my rumba just started, so I'm sorry for the background noise. Uh, it's programmed to start at nine and I don't know how to change it. My husband's in charge of that. Um, and so um, the other thing is just the Q2 planning. We spent um, Q1 really moving to integrated campaigns and programs. And we have some campaigns that are about brand and some about pipeline. And we've like refocused on the pipeline campaigns um, to make sure that we can actually like, you know, keep the lights on. But we re um, evaluated all the messaging and sort of what the content and deliverables would be within those programs. Um, and then finally, like we see that the salespeople, like they probably have some extra time. And so it's a good time for us to really focus on like, how do we ensure that we have consistency with sales on the message on like how they're pitching value, how like in that, when we get to the backside of this, that they like really can capitalize on um, those next steps. Awesome. I know we're, we're out of time, but I want to say thank you to the co-hosts, Meg and Trisha, Chris. Trisha's Roomba. This has been an amazing time together. Um, and, you know, I, I get so much inspiration from these and just from, from you all, but also as all of you that are, are listening in. Um, and so some folks have been harder hit. Other folks I, I saw in the chats are, are not. But the most common thing here is that we are all in this together. And so thank you for sharing and being vulnerable. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep doing these as long as we need to. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for hosting, Anthony. No worries. Cheers. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Bye.